Hey everyone, welcome back to the Flesh Tools series for SideFX's Project Grot. In the previous chapter, we've covered how to turn our very straight curves into fascinating organic looking bundles of flesh. In this chapter, we will polish our tool by replacing our placeholder rocks and by refining the logic behind spawning our flesh curves. Let's get into Houdini! Alright, so here we are again in our Houdini scene, and I'm sure that a lot of you have been dying to replace these placeholder rocks with something a bit more polished looking. And this is what this chapter is about. And just as a quick refresher, the reason why this tool exists in the first place is because we were looking for an auxiliary tool to our ruins tool. If you remember, the way that the ruins tool works is that based on the vertex paint of the user, we remove pieces of geometry from this concrete structure. However, it leaves open this question of where do these pieces go? We didn't want to just scatter some rocks on the ground, but we wanted to push this idea of a living organism hiding beneath the concrete structure. So what we thought would be cool is if some of these concrete pieces would still be half attached to the surface. They're hanging down, but they're being connected by a thread of flesh. And initially, we were trying to solve this uh, in a procedural manner, that it is already a part of the tool, but we noticed that while it gives the artist a lot of flexibility and, and quick iteration time, it also makes it incredibly hard to art direct because you're basically dependent on a good random seed. And that's not what we want. So halfway throughout the project, we decided that it would be a better idea to split this feature off into its own tool where we give the artist complete artistic control. So what these rocks should look like is basically pieces of concrete that have fallen off of the structure. And I thought a really easy way to get there is to simply um, fracture a cube and make it look kind of like concrete, right? So we can just get a cube over here. I'm just going to get the RBD material fracture node. And I'm going to keep it very simple. Uh, I'll remove the second layer. I'll enable the edge detail. Let's just get an exploded view node to see what's going on inside. Okay. And I'm going to enable some interior detail just to give it a bit more interesting shapes inside. And next, what I want to do is I want to get the lab's edge damage node. I want to do this once for each piece, so I'm going to get a for loop, type in name. All right, we can increase this a little bit to something like five or maybe even more. Let's see. Let's see how the end result looks if we do this over all the pieces. Yeah, maybe something like that. So how can we spawn a random piece on each of these points? Well, the cool thing about the copy to points node is that it has this piece attribute toggle right here. The way it works is that between the mesh we want to spawn and the points we want to spawn them on, it expects a corresponding attribute that we have to supply. So let's just start with our pieces and I'm going to get a connectivity node. I'm going to set it to primitive, I'm going to call it name and attribute type I'm going to set to string and I'm going to remove the piece prefix. So all I want to end up with is basically a name attribute where each piece has its own number. And the reason why I want it as a string is because I want to use the attribute randomize node and it has a really neat feature that only works with floats or strings where under distribution we can say instead of uniform continuous we can say custom discrete and we can change it to a string and there we can specify the amount of random values that we want to spawn on these points. So for instance, five, because I have five pieces. And then I'm just gonna type in zero, one, two, three, and four, and make sure to change it to name. And now each of our points has a random name attribute value. So if I now replace my placeholder rock with my cube pieces, well, initially it's gonna spawn the cube, but if I now enable the piece attribute, we can see that it chooses this random piece for each of the points. One thing you have to be aware of is because we're using a random cube piece, that means that they're all a bit offset from the center. And this might lead to some unexpected results. If we look at each of these corner points, we can see that they're a bit offset, whereas I would expect the piece to be exact in the center. And we can deal with that by just adding a match size node after the edge damage node in our loop. And another thing um, that we should be mindful of is, of course, the poly count. So um, after this loop, we could, for instance, get a poly reduce node and maybe set it to something like 
And again, because we're dealing with vertex colors later on, I want to make sure that um, even though these areas are flat and don't need detail, I still want to have a certain density of vertices to make sure that I can add some vertex color on it. So we can do that by changing the equalized length parameter to something a bit larger, maybe 1e minus 6. That should work. And now that we have our new rocks, let's have a look at how it's going to affect our flesh. So this looks really, really cool now. Let's also play around with the scale. I'm going to make them twice as big and see how that changes it. And let's play around with the seed. And there's just something so satisfying with a tool that just works, you know? It's not doing much, but the thing that it's doing, it's doing really well. And I think that's really enjoyable to, to make and to see. And while we're on the topic of polishing, I think one thing that we could also tackle while we're at it is th the distribution of the flesh spawn points. Because if we go over here to our scatter node, we can see that they are all being scattered in this very uniform looking way. And I mean, of course, we can leave it like that if you want to, but I thought I might use this chapter also to, um, to show you how we can affect that. A method that we could use, for instance, is something we've learned in the Ruins tutorial series, where we use a density attribute to drive where certain points are spawned. Let me just disable the forest total count and change it to a density scale. And then let's crank it up a little bit. Yep. And what we can do to get this density attribute is we can get a, uh, an attribute noise. I'm gonna change it to a float and I'm gonna call it mask. And to uh, make it have an effect, we can just enable the density attribute toggle and type in mask. Okay, it's a bit subtle. To make this effect more obvious, we can, for instance, change the range values from positive to zero centered. And now it's very clear what is happening. So we can now see that in, our, in the peaks of our mask attribute, we are spawning points and in the valleys, we're not spawning anything. But I think that this is a bit intense. Um, and if you're looking for a bit more fine-tuned control, you can change it from this to min-max, for instance. And here we can tweak it to whatever we feel like. Maybe I want the maximum to be a bit higher, but also have a little bit, but I just want to remove the minimum a tiny bit so that we also have some empty areas, maybe. However, I do want to... I do want to avoid having completely empty areas, so it's it requires a bit going back and forth, maybe also playing with the element size and see what works. Or what we can also do is um, we can layer several noises on top of each other. So maybe the first layer of noise should be relatively safe and go from a range of, I don't know, 0 to 1.5. And then we can add another attribute noise on top of that. And um, this time we're going to change it from add to multiply. And we can do it in a range between 0 and 1, and then um, maybe make a smaller element size. That way we can kind of poke some holes into this, uh, into this pattern. Let's see what that does to our flesh. So apart, of course, from seeing that there's less flesh now, if we take a look at how it's being spawned, we can see that um, we now have these little clusters of flesh instead of um, this very even distribution. So I think you can spend quite some time refining this, but I don't want to get into this too deep. I just wanted to show you that this is uh, one of those things that you can tweak and maybe reuse for other tools also. Oh, yeah, And another thing that we can adapt in the behavior of the flesh is we can also add the rocks themselves to the collision. Because right now, the way that the collision works is we only check for the environment. What we might want to do is we might want to also include the rocks themselves and that way they can also connect between each other so i'm just going to get a merge node and drop that here and i'm going to add the rocks to it and it's probably a pretty subtle effect but if we look closely we can see that some of these connections are now between the rocks themselves which just adds a little bit more even to this feeling of of an interconnected organism that's kind of growing all over the place and one last thing that i want to add to the flesh is like right now it already looks really really cool but every strand has the same thickness and i thought an easy way that we could add some more variation to this is by using our existing volume to also drive the thickness of our splines so in that way the flesh that is bundled up together is a bit thicker and the flesh that are these like lonely offshoots are a bit thinner. And this is also just like one line of code 
So I'm just going to get my um, my splines, the ones that are resampled. Then I'm going to get my volume analysis node and put that in the second input. And then I'm just going to type at pscale equals. And then we're going to do a volume sample V. And we're going to type 1 density at P. And if we look at the result, we can see that it immediately has an effect, but of course, uh, it's not really what we want. But we can already see though that the parts that are closer together are thicker than the parts that are by themselves. So it, in a way, it is having the effect that we want. It's just that the values are not in the range that we want them to be. So to fix that, we can just get an attribute normalize node. I'm going to put that before the sweep node, and I'm just going to type p scale in there. We can go even one step further by modifying this output range parameter. So for instance, I would never want p scale to be able to reach a value of zero, because that would mean that we have effectively zero thickness. So I think as the minimum, I would want something like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 or something like that. And maybe we want to allow the very bundled up flesh to be even thicker than they are right now. So maybe something like 1.25 or 1.5. Um, something like that. And uh, again, like with the rocks, we can also add uniform scale multiplier so that we can drive all of that at once because we only know what it's going to look like for real when it's in the scene. But I think this is pretty good. All right, yeah. We're basically done with the visual side of things. And if you follow along for the runes tutorial, you probably know what comes next. Because we're dealing with a vertex color based shader in Unreal, we need to make sure that this data is also present on our tool. So what we're gonna do in the next lesson is we're gonna add, for instance, on our edge where we're gonna add some vertex color we're gonna add some color where the concrete broke up. We're also gonna write in um, some information on our flesh, for instance, for the thickness, which will drive our subsurface scattering shader to make the middle parts look thinner than the outer parts and a little bit more. But yeah, so that's it for this part. And I hope I see you in the next one. All right, bye-bye.